So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we will uh, spend uh, most of the time talking about uh, uh, electrophysiology uh, related to the cardiac surgeon. So you might find the, uh, the first presentation a bit redundant and um, you might know all of the information, but it's good to review and reinforce some of, uh, some of the knowledge uh, about uh, maybe for cardiac surgeon. And for the next talk, we'll focus and advance and, uh, and atrial fibrillation surgery and uh, 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 techniques, uh, literatures, uh, tips and tricks. So uh, for, uh, to start with AB for 101 AB for cardiac surgeon, as a surgeon, we need to know uh, uh, different type of uh, uh, AB studies. And uh, uh, the, the question here is, what are the different type of AB study that we need to know? Uh, if the patient goes to the uh, EB lab with an active arrhythmias and they, the, and they try to map it, this is, we call it active mapping. That means the electrophysiologist will map the arrhythmia during uh, uh, active arrhythmia. However, uh, the basic mapping gets when the patient goes to the, to the EB lab and sinus rhythm, and then the electrophysiologist uh, try to induce the arrhythmia to be able to, to, to find its source. Sometimes you do need to do both of them, uh, such as uh, atrial flutter, because we know that most of the patients with atrial flutter, uh, you can actually break the cycle just by mapping, by, uh, by ablating uh, the cave with tricuspid isthmus. So in these cases, you do need to do any active arrhythmia, just go and ablate the area according to anatomical mapping. There is something called entertainment mapping. And in this, you place your electrodes in the circuit. And if you're, uh, you try to, uh, to actually uh, uh, mimic uh, the pattern of the arrhythmias, if you're uh, in a, on the circuit of the arrhythmia. And advanced mapping, this is when you actually use uh, different uh, electrodes in both uh, in the four chambers, like in the left atrium, uh, left ventricles, uh, uh, right atrium, right ventricles, to try to find uh, the source of arrhythmias. So there is two important uh, uh, SVTs we need to know, uh, which we call the first one, we call it AV nodal reentry arrhythmia, and this is the most common form of the SVT. And in this arrhythmia, we have two accessory pathways. We have the slow and we have uh, the fast. And most commonly, this, is, this kind of arrhythmia has happened at the triangle of Koch. And this is very important because if you, if, as electrophysiologists, if you wanted to play it in this area, you have to be careful do not to injure the, the AV node and cause the patient to go into uh, a complete heart block. So we have two types of AV uh, reentry arrhythmias. We have what you call the typical ones. Typical, the anti-grade will go through the slow pathways and the retrograde will be through the fast pathways. And in this case, you, this is what you see mainly in the SVT. When you see there will be uh, uh, no B waves, you just find uh, uh, a fast uh, rhythm with no B waves. Uh, and because if the vision goes very fast, you will have the B wave will be fused to the QRS. A typical ones, this is when, when actually it's, it's the reverse. When the anti-grade uh, 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 accessory pathways will be the fast and the retrograde will be the slow. And in this case, you will find an inverted B waves into the inferior leads. The other re-entry, we don't call it AV nodal. This is, we call it AV re-entry. And in this part of the of, of, of arrhythmias, the AV node itself is part of, of the circuit. It's, uh, and we have one accessory pathways. Uh, this is the most second uh, common uh, arrhythmia in SVT. So there is two, uh, 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 the, and the most common form of this SVT, it's the WBW. So typically, uh, uh, the anti-grade will be the AV node and the accessory pathways will be a retrograde. And in this case, you will, you will see uh, inverted B waves after QRS. A typical form, and this is when you see the, the, the anti-grade will go through accessory pathway and the retrograde will be through an AV node. And you will see the B wave uh, closely uh, uh, precedes QRS. And this is what you see in, in WBW, when you see a short BR on Telver and you will see uh, uh, a delta wave at the QRS. So AV re-entry arrhythmias, the most common presentation, the patient will present it to you with palpitation. And the indication for ablation is uh, if the patient is symptomatic with rapid ventricular uh, conduction and failure of, uh, of medical therapy, 
or sometimes the patient himself refused to take the medication, then you have to do uh, uh, ablation. One of the relative uh, indication if the patient have a uh, uh, history of, uh, of uh, sudden family death. There is multiple types of atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, ectopic atrial arrhythmias, or sinus uh, uh, nodri entry tachyarrhythmia. Mapping of atrial tachycardia is very difficult because it could originate anywhere in both atria. However, 3D mapping now, people, uh, I mean, the electrophysiologists get more ex uh, experience and they can actually do uh, a very advanced mapping and they could do uh, atrial ablation. However, the most common side that you will find uh, an abnormal fo uh, uh, focus of arrhythmias is crystal terminalis, pulmonary veins, valve annulus, and atrial appendages, both right and the left side. So atrial flutter, uh, it has a, a macro re-entry circuit, and you need to know the boundaries of uh, the atrial flutter circuit. We have anterior boundaries, and we have a posterior boundaries. Anterior boundaries, it's the tricuspid valve and you lie. Posterior boundaries it will be the SVC, the crystal terminalis, and the coronary sinus. So there is two forms, typically, which goes uh, uh, counterclockwise, and you will see uh, a negative B waves at the inferior lead. And a typical form, and this is, will go clockwise, and you will see inverted v, uh, B waves at the V1 and uh, upgraded at the V6. Uh, as we discussed before, uh, ablation for uh, uh, the uh, uh, cable tricuspid annuli, it will, it will have a 90% uh, 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 success rate, but the, the rest of the 10% the patient will be at risk of having a, a, a pacemaker. Other uh, atrial arrhythmias, including uh, atrial fibrillation, we uh, atrial fibrillation, it's, uh, it's very difficult to treat. In the old fashion, you, you used to ablate the AV node and then they put uh, a VVI pacemaker. But this is actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, this is very old fashioned. However, sometimes if you have an old patient and the patient cannot be treated with uh, not tolerating medical therapy, uh, then uh, this, this might be a, a viable option. And we'll talk about this later. Uh, possible uh, focus, uh, as we said, pulmonary vein appendages around the cavus. Uh, and you need to know that the most common complication of uh, ablation is pulmonary venous uh, stenosis. Sometimes when patients go for surgery and, they, and, the, and there will be involvement of opening uh, the atrials, you will find sometimes uh, a typical flutter uh, uh, into the lateral of the uh, atrial wall, and this is very easy to treat. You can send the patient for catheter ablation at the edge of, of the scar. So most of you uh, heard about uh, uh, shads and shads to VASC. So in the, old, in the old era, the people used to use a CHAT score just to, uh, 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 to look at the risk of stroke related to the atrial fibrillation. And as you can see here, uh, the CHAT, CHAT's two risk score, which is including uh, congestive heart failure, hypertension, age above 75, diabetes, stroke, or TIA. And according to, to give the points, and according to the points, there, there will be uh, 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 risk stratification for stroke, and medical management related to this, to this risk score. However, there will be there is updated uh, uh, Chad's uh, risk, which is Chad's uh, VASC2. And here we could see that uh, here they elaborate more on CHF or lower ejection fraction. Hypertension is still the same. They give a higher uh, uh, point for the age above 75. And they added if the patient have a vascular disease or age below 75 uh, up to the up to 65 and if the patient is female, and they give each one uh, a, a one point. What are the important thing about uh, 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 Shad's VASC2, or Shad's? The, most, uh, the, 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 the important thing is uh, how you talk to the patients about the risk of stroke. So as you can see here, if the patient scores zero, they will have zero risk of stroke. Uh, and if the patient, uh, and the maximum risk of stroke is 15%, if the patient score, score nine. Now you can go through this. This is very important because this is how you will uh, uh, talk to the patient, convince the patients that they might need an ablation surgery, medical therapy, or surgical ablation. This is a, a Canadian guidelines algorithm for uh, uh, oral anticoagulation therapy 
and related to atrial fibrillation. So as you remember from Chad VASC2 here, if the age above 65, regardless of this patient's chats, according to the Canadian guidelines, this patient should receive oral anticoagulation. And if you go here, they prefer NOAC, which is a new uh, oral anticoagulant, prefer over warfarin, non-verbal atrial fibrillation. However, if the patient less than 65, then you look at the CHAT score. If he have any of the CHAT score or the CHAT score of one, he will go to the arm of uh, 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 oral anticoagulation. If the patient have no CHAT2 risk factor, then you look, does the patient have any history of coronary artery disease or arterial vascular disease? If yes, he will go for aspirin. If no, there will be no need for antithrombotic therapy. So for a patient with atrial fibrillation, an indication for the primary uh, of uh, primary coronary artery disease, the prevention or stroke or coronary artery disease, arterial vascular disease, the same thing. If the patient is less than 65 with a shot to uh, zero and there's no coronary artery disease, no, no vascular disease, he doesn't need uh, thrombotic therapy. If the patient has age less than 65, the charge of two of uh, charge uh, two is zero, but the patient have a stable coronary artery disease or vascular disease, will go for aspirin. If the patient above 65 will have a charge score uh, two of one, then he will go for oral anticoagulation therapy. And as you see here, the NOAC is preferred over warfarin and non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So how if the patient comes for an elective BCI? If the patient is uh, shad uh, two score of zero and age less than 65, he will go with dual uh, antibiotic therapy for 12 months. And after 12 months, he will need aspirin only. However, if the patient is above 65 or he has a shad score two, uh, uh, shads two more than or equal one, then he will go with oral anticoagulant and then calipidogrel for 12 months. And after 12 months, he just need oral anticoagulation uh, uh, only. If the patient presented with non-STEMI or STEMI, it's very important. Here it goes to the age and chats too. If the age is less than 65 and chats less than zero, if the patient had no BCI, then the patient will be in aspirin or uh, aspirin plus the Kegligor or Calibidigor for 12 months. And after 12 months, you need aspirin only. If the patient goes for BCI, then you put him in aspirin, Tegagligor, Bisigrel, or Calibidigor for 12 months. And after uh, 12 months, you will go in aspirin only. So if the patient has age less than 65 and child score uh, less than zero, even if he has atrial fibrillation, he will be treated only as if he has uh, a, a coronary artery disease without any consideration for oral anticoagulant. But if the patient age above 65 or he has a child score more than one, then oral anticoagulation play a major role. If the patient has no BCI, you put him in oral anticoagulant and calibidogrel for 12 months, and after that, he will be only in oral anticoagulant. And as we said here, NOAC is preferred. However, the patient goes for BCI, then here he, he needs oral anticoagulant and dual antibiotic therapy, we call it triple therapy, for the first three to six months. After six months to 12 months, he will be an oral anticoagulant and calipidogrel, and finally he will end up on oral anticoagulant. And this is, as we said again, NOAC is preferred over warfarin. Any questions so far? Uh, yes, Doctor. Uh, this is Doctor Murtada. R5 cardiac surgery is then. Doctor, in the statement, Anawak is preferred over warfarin for non valvular AF. Uh, there is an update um, from the American Heart Association 2019, um, and I'm quoting the guidelines here. Uh, they said that the term non valvular AF is no longer used. And they said that exclusion criteria for uh, SHADS VASC assessment and the use of NOACs, now defined as moderate to severe mitral stenosis or a mechanical heart valve. So what I understood from this statement that uh, nowadays, um, NOACs can be used in patients with, uh, for example, tissue valves, or, uh, or uh, for patients who have atrial fibrillation with uh, uh, any valvular disease, except for patients with uh, moderate to severe mitral stenosis. So for example, if I have a patient with atrial fibrillation and moderate or severe MR, um, or a tissue valve, um, um, do you think that uh, it's, it's safe to use NOACs for those patients instead of warfarin? Look, I mean, it's, it's, you could use NOAC, okay? And this is, uh, as you said, um, this is, uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about American guidelines. This is a Canadian guidelines. But uh, I personally prefer to use Coumadin in, uh, in, uh, in uh, post-operative period. 
because the problem with NOAC, if this patient is presented with uh, any uh, uh, delayed tamponade or bleeding, you, it will be very hard for you to reverse uh, the effect of, uh, of NOAC. But yes, if the patient have any uh, valvular pathology except uh, mitral stenosis, he can be treated with, uh, with, with NOAC. Uh, but to be clear, uh, and, uh, I'm not in immediate post-operative period uh, because of the, in the first three months after surgery, we need to use the comedine for another reason. For the uh, to wait for the abethalization of the valve, but uh, after three months, do you? Yes, yes, okay, okay, okay. After after three to six months, yeah. now the uh, now you, you could do because this is will be if you correct the the valvular the valvular heart disease of the patient, then you will go to the arm of non valvular AFib. You get my point? Yes. Yeah, and if you have the tissue valve. Even if you have a tissue valve, because the guidelines is clear that you need warfarin for the first three to six months. After six months, you could do whatever you want to do. You really want to put him in, you, you want to continue in warfarin, you want to shift him to a walk, that's, that's okay. But as in the, in the, in the beginning of the, of like in the immediate post-operative period, I will still use uh, 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 the warfarin. Some patients will, will, uh, will refuse to take warfarin. Mm -hmm. And sometimes put them in new walk, but this is not the common practice that they use. Okay, thank you. So surgical treatment of uh, atrial fibrillation. So incidence of atrial fibrillation affect 2% of general population and 10% on people above 60 years old. What are the morbidities associated with atrial fibrillation? So, most of the people, they will have a palpitation and it will increase their patient uh, anxiety. As you know that you lose your AV uh, synchrony and this uh, indeed decreases uh, the cardiac output. And the most important thing is the thromboembolism. There will be three to five uh, fold increase in the stroke. And as you can see that uh, the, the patient with atrial fibrillation, there is 20% risk of, uh, of stroke. And above age of 80, atrial fibrillation, it's responsible for 25% of all strokes. So what is the advantages to be in normal sinus rhythm? So the advantages is this is which actually cover the comorbidities. So you decrease the risk of thromboembolism. You don't lose your atrial kick, and this will be uh, participate in less heart failure symptoms. And you do need to be an anticoagulation. And by this, you will take out the anticoagulation side effects. So what are the, cl the, the, the classes of atrial fibrillation according to the uh, uh, Heart Rhythm Society? So there is uh, uh, like five or like let's say four kind of atrial fibrillation, which is proximal, persistence atrial fibrillation, long standing persistence, and permanent atrial fibrillation. So proximal atrial fibrillation, this is the atrial fibrillation that terminates spontaneously or with intervention, either with uh, 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 medical treatment or uh, electrical shock, with less than seven days. Episode may occur with, with, with variable frequencies. Persistence atrial fibrillation, this is the atrial fibrillation that lasts more than seven days. Long-standing persistence, this is the atrial fibrillation will go for more than 12 months. And permanent atrial fibrillation, when the physician and the patient get into agreement that they're not gonna uh, uh, attempt any uh, uh, restoring or maintaining into a normal sinus rhythm. So what is the bad physiology of, of, uh, of atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation has also, again, multiple uh, focus and multiple macro reentry circuit. It's not like atrial flutter. Atrial flutter usually, it has uh, 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 clear pathways as we saw before, but in atrial fibrillation, there will be multiple focus and there will be multiple uh, uh, macro reentry circuit. And there is three things that have, need to happen. You need to have a trigger, you need to have the substrate, and you need to have the modulation. Triggers means there is something uh, uh, cause atrial uh, uh, stretch, such as a patient of, with, with valvular heart disease, mitral stenosis, or mitral regurgitation. The atrial gets stretched. And also, at the same time, you need to have the substrate, which is the inflammation that happens in the, in the atrial wall. And the modulation, sometimes when the patients do activities or increase the sympathetic tone. So when these things work together, it will cause the patient to go into um, an atrial fibrillation. As we uh, discussed, uh, uh, most of the atrial fibrillation uh, focus happen around the pulmonary venous, and that's why in, uh, uh, in electrophysiology studies, most of the people, they will do uh, uh, a pulmonary venous isolation 
and this should take care of uh, 50 to 70 percent of atrial fibrillation. And uh, uh, as we know from the uh, histological studies that electrical excitement and cardiac tissue extend to one to four centimeters beyond the pulmonary vein. So if, the, if you start the stimulation at the pulmonary vein or the multiple or the abnormal focal the pulmonary vein, it will extend to all left atrium, like one to four centimeters. And you need to know the conduction velocity around the pulmonary vein is 0.3 millimeter per second. However, uh, when, when you go far in the atrium, the conduction velocity increases, and that's why the propagation of atrial fibrillation gets faster. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the atrium can be excited by uh, uh, from single or multiple focus. And as we said before, if you isolate the pulmonary vein, you will have a 70% successful in proxismal atrial fibrillation. However, there will be less in persistence atrial fibrillation because in persistence atrial fibrillation, you will have a multiple macro reentries uh, uh, phenomena. So when you talk about ablation technique, what are the best feature to, to do ablation or, or to use ablation technique? First of all, this ablation technique should have the ability to produce a bi-directional block. It should cause uh, a transmural injury. It should be self-limiting. That means when you use it to a certain area, it should not cause any damage to the surrounding structure. And it should be simple because if you make it complicated, the people will shy away. And it can be adopted uh, via minimally invasive approaches. So uh, what are the available ablation methods that uh, you guys need to know about? So. Uh, we have cryoablation. Cryoablation, we will talk about this in, in more depth and details in the, in the next talk, but cryoablation, this will cause uh, 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 cooling into the tissue uh, up to minus 90 degrees and will cause ice crystals in intracellular and uh, extracellular space. And this indeed will cause uh, 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 the, the tissue injury. Uh, Radio frequency, uh, this is actually causing thermal injuries. Uh, usually goes from uh, 350 kilohertz to, 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 to 2 megahertz. You can measure the effectiveness by measuring the conduction at the, at the legion side. So uh, the manufacturing claim that when you use a radio frequency, uh, the, 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 what you call it, uh, the, the, the bipolar radio frequency, when does the radio frequency finish the ablation? Because when you do the ablation itself, the radio frequency will, will touch Will, will examine the conduction between the jaws and the, the tissue. And it will stop ablation when, when see the conduction that uh, stop. And, that, and that's why they, say, they will say, that's the only way that you, you will make sure that you go uh, transmural. Microwave energy, this is electromagnetic, which causes oscillation of, uh, of water molecules. Laser energy, this is caused again, it's like a, a radio frequency will cause a thermal injuries. Focus ultrasound, it will go very high waves. I don't think this is a, 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 a very important to know what are the major difference between them, but at least you need to know what are the, 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 the energy sources that's available to do your, uh, your ablation. And you need to focus on two most common things which you use, which we're going to talk about in the next talk, which is the cryoablation and radio frequency. So this is not the guidelines. This is just uh, 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 a general uh, uh, recommendation for uh, when we to ablate uh, a patient. So if a patient presented with solo atrial fibrillation or lone atrial fibrillation, if the patient have a significant side effect from uh, medication, so, uh, uh, such as he develop bleeding or he, he develop uh, bradycardia from the uh, uh, rate or rhythm control, if, uh, again, if atrial fibrillation, failure of the medical therapy, that you cannot control his atrial fibrillation with medication, or the patient is atrial fibrillation, you try to treat him, to treat him medically, but however, he goes into uh, induce uh, tachycardia, induce cardiomyopathy, or if the patient have any contraindication to anticoagulation. Uh, patient have history of GI bleeding, brain bleeding, or um, or if the patient on, on top of anticoagulation, he develop uh, thromboembolism. This is all clues that this patient should go for uh, uh, an atrial fibrillation surgery. How about concomitant atrial fibrillation? That means the patient's coming for uh, another cardiac surgery, and at the same time, he had atrial fibrillation. So according to the uh, AHA guidelines, uh, there is no class one indication for atrial fibrillation, it's class 2A. However, we discuss this more in details on the next talk, but when we talk about STS guideline 2017, it actually uh, um, uh, uh, class one, but we'll talk, as I said, in details. 
And uh, uh, they said it's contraindicated in high-risk patients. However, I will show you uh, uh, again in next talk uh, more data and convince you uh, uh, how is atrial fibrillation is useful even in high-risk people. So according to the Canadian guidelines in 2016, surgical ablation is recommended as adjunct to mitral, aortic, or cabbage procedure. And this is conditional uh, uh, guidelines. If its success rate is high, and the risk of causing sinus node injury is less as low. And left atrial appendage of seclusion should be done along with maze procedure if this does not increase the risk of surgery. So what is the AHA guidelines? This is 2014 for atrial fibrillation. Maze is indicated with mitral valve surgeries and patients with chronic resistance atrial fibrillation. By atrial maze is reasonable with mitral valve surgeries and chronic and, chronic and persistence atrial fibrillation. Class 2B, maze or pulmonary venous isolation can be considered for patients with proximal atrial fibrillation, symptomatic with embolism or anticoagulation going for mitral or a procedure other than mitral. However, we'll talk in uh, details about uh, the new guidelines in the next talk. If, if you guys want to look, uh, this is the, the steps of, uh, of Cox maze 4, but I will, uh, let's do it uh, through the diagram. So, Cox maze 4 can be done in, uh, in, in two energy sources. It can be done with cryothermia or can be done with uh, um, RF radio frequency ablation. So uh, uh, this uh, paper actually came from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rodolphe uh, Damiano from San Luis in Misery because the, he was working with Dr. James Cox and they actually uh, published a lot of paper on, uh, on uh, atrial fibrillation surgery. So uh, I will take you through uh, 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 this operation. So you can uh, practically, you could do uh, uh, the right pulmonary venous isolation and the right sided, uh, 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 and the right side isolation or the right side lesion uh, uh, on bump, uh, but without beating heart, without cross clamping. So first of all, um, uh, you need to go and uh, um, uh, 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 dissect around the pulmonary vein, the right side. And then as you see here, you put the jaws in, uh, around the pulmonary vein, but you have to make sure that you are in the atrial tissue. And then you do uh, uh, the application. Usually it will take up to, up to 30 seconds to do the legion, but most of the surgeons will do three uh, application for uh, uh, radio frequency, just to make sure they have transmurality. Then when you go to the right atrium, you make a small uh, uh, opening at the edge of the appendage, and then you ablate into the right atrial wall and then you ablate to the mitral valve annuli uh, at the area between the junction between the commissure of anterior and, uh, 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 and septal uh, uh, leaflet. Then you do uh, arteriotomy into the right atrium. And you, as you see here, it's very close to the IVC. And then you do one application toward the, uh, the SVC and you do one application toward uh, the IVC. And then you do the application from the tip of the atriotomy to the uh, tricuspid valve uh, annulus at the area between the, the, the uh, uh, septal and the posterior leaflet. However, you have to be careful here. Sorry, not the septal, sorry, the anterior and posterior. You have to be careful that the RCA is very close. Uh, uh, some, of, some of the surgeon, they will dissect the RCA away from there before they do the application. And the other surgeon will not use a bipolar here. They will use a cryothermia just to prevent RCA injury. This is, by, by this, you finish the right-sided lesion using uh, um, uh, radio frequency. Then you do the left side. The left side, you start your operation by uh, opening uh, uh, the left atrium. And by this, you will do this line with, with cut and sew. Then you, are, uh, you need to do uh, 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 the left pulmonary vein. How you do the left pulmonary vein? You retract the heart uh, uh, superiorly, and then you, you have to, to, to cut uh, 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 as you can see here, uh, the left-sided lesion, you need, to, you need to arrest the heart and open the left atrium, and you can complete the box lesion with committed. So uh, when you do uh, 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 the, the left side pulmonary vein, you have to dissect around the left pulmonary veins and uh, put the jaws uh, uh, around them and then do the same thing. But you have to be careful also that you need to uh, 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 close to the atrial tissue, not to the pulmonary vein, not to cause pulmonary vein uh, 
stenosis. But there is a little bit of a trick here. There is a tendon between the pulmonary vein and between the, uh, uh, the pulmonary artery that sometimes can hold it, called uh, tendon of Montoro. So you have to cut this tendon. Uh, so you have to dissect between the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins to be able to get the jaws all the way around the pulmonary veins. And, uh, and then after you, you finish the pulmonary vein isolation, you need to cut uh, uh, the right atri uh, the, the atrial appendage. And this is, can be done from, from the outside. So you amputate the appendage. And then you um, you put your uh, your uh, uh, cryovermia through uh, from the left atrial appendage to the left superior pulmonary vein, and after that you close uh, you close your uh, you close your uh, uh, atrial appendage, and then you finish your box legion by going from the left atriotomy to continue uh, uh, from because you can you know you isolate this and you isolate this, and then you apply uh, here the, the line here to isolate this area. And finally, you apply the, the jaw to isolate the mitral valve from here to here. And then the mitral valve annulus, you apply uh, uh, a cryothermia. So what are the other considerations of atrial fibrillation surgery? Some people, they, can, they do only a left-sided maze. I will go in details in the next talk about all, all the consideration of atrial fibrillation. Some people do uh, pulmonary venous isolation only. They do it as a box, or they do it as a separate isolation with connection in the middle or they just, they just do uh, isolation for the pain without a connection. The freedom from the atrial fibrillation at, uh, in the Cox maze 4, and as we will discuss this in the next talk, range between 91 to 97 to 2 to 5 years, over pulmonary venous isolation up to 50% 50, 50 at 57 months. This is uh, 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 taken uh, from uh, uh, Cohen book, and this is actually one of uh, Dr. Cope's James uh, uh, publication. As we discussed here, as you remember here, this is the right side lesion. You do your cut here in the right atrium to, to the right atrial body, and then you do uh, to the uh, tricuspid valve annulus. Then you do your incision here in the right atrium, and then you do the IVC and the SVC, and then you do from the atriotomy to the uh, mitral valve, to the tricuspid valve annuli, and then. Uh, uh, and the tricuspid valve annulus itself, okay? You could uh, use the, the, the cryothermia to prevent injury, as we said, to the right coronary artery. On the left side, you do your atriotomy. You isolated the pulmonary vein with, uh, as we discussed, with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the bipolar jaws, and even here. And then uh, from the atriotomy, to go to the, to the coronary sinus. And from the left atrial appendage to the left superior pulmonary vein, and then you amputate the appendage and you suture it. And then you use a cryothermia to complete the mitral uh, valve uh, annulus. So this is one of the most common paper that actually confused people. This was published in 2015 in the, CST, uh, the, C, in the CTSNE uh, net uh, investigator led by Dr. Gilinov from Cleveland Clinic. I actually met Dr. Gilinov and asked him about this study because in this study, he did it a randomized monthly centric trial into uh, surgical uh, ablation for uh, uh, atrial fibrillation during mitral valve surgery. They included 260 patients. And their hypothesis is they want to compare the surgical ablation with mitral valve surgery in context of uh, long standing uh, 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 atrial fibrillation, ablation versus no ablation. In the ablation group, uh, uh, they also did a subgroup analysis where they compare. Uh, 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 by atrial maze versus uh, 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 a unilateral maze. Uh, and here it's very, uh, you have to be careful. They call it, they call it uh, unilateral maze, but it's, it's basically not unilateral maze. They just do pulmonary venous isolation. And everybody in both groups, they went uh, into uh, uh, left atrial appendage uh, closure. So their primary endpoint, they were looking for the freedom from atrial fibrillation at six and 12 months. And they detected that by using halter monitor for three days. So they included adult patients with persistence, long standing persistence. So there is no proximal atrial fibrillation. All of these people, they have, they're going for mitral valve surgery. They have persistence or long standing persistence atrial fibrillation. Persistence atrial fibrillation, uh, they, they, they defined it as uh, non self limiting atrial fibrillation for more than seven days and long standing persistence for more than 12 months, which is go with uh, the, 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 the guidelines recommendation or definition of atrial fibrillation. So the result, the freedom from atrial fibrillation at six months and 12 months, it was 63.2 in the uh, ablation group versus 29 in the non-ablation uh, group. 
look at this. This is very bad result. So you only achieved uh, at 12 months, you achieved only 63% success rate uh, in the ablation group. And even when he compared uh, by a, a, a bilateral versus pulmonary venous isolation, he did not find a difference. They were, he did not find any difference in mortality and maze between uh, ablation and no ablation group. And they found that the ablation group had a higher requirement of a pacemaker. And this is how you can see this, okay? See, this is mitral valve alone, and this is a mitral valve ablation. And then when you compare between bilateral mazes versus PVI, he did not find uh, any difference. So in the next talk, again, we will we'll show you, we will show you actually data from the same group that showed uh, this was not a uh, uh, correct conclusion. And in the same paper, he show you here how he do uh, 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 the bilateral maze. So this is the pulmonary venous isolation set with bipolar device. So he will do, he will uh, isolate uh, the, uh, he will isolate uh, the pulmonary veins and he will isolate the pulmonary, uh, the uh, left atrial appendage. The left atrial component for bilateral lesion set and, uh, and bipolar device, he will isolate the both vein and then he will continue the box lesion and he will do the mitral valve annuli and he will do uh, the left atrial uh, appendage. They can do it this fashion or they can do it uh, 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 this fashion by using uh, a unipolar device. And the right-sided lesion is the same. So they do um, uh, 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 they do uh, open uh, from here to the tricuspid annulus, from here to the tricuspid annulus, and from here to the SVC and IVC. So this is a very useful post-operative atrial fibrillation guidelines. I know it's old, but it's useful for you guys to know, just in case of uh, sometimes you get, you, you get asked questions about uh, the incidence of post-operative atrial fibrillation. So according to the Canadian uh, guidelines, the post-operative atrial fibrillation uh, in a cabbage patient uh, goes up to 30%. If you do valve cases, up to 40%. If you do combined cases, it's go up to 50%. And most of the atrial fibrillation and the post-operative period happen in between uh, day two and day, uh, and day four uh, uh, post-operative period. So what are the risk factors? If the, of course, if the patient have a prior atrial fibrillation, uh, it's higher on the male patients. If the patient has serial hypertension, if the patient required intraintercoolum pump, if the patient have prolonged ventilation more than 24 hours, if the patient wasn't with a beta blocker for some reason, he developed low cardiac output post open you, and there will be withdrawal of beta blocker. As we said, the type of surgery, because if you do cabbage, not like when you do combined, like when you do caval, uh, number of bypasses, some people related this to the more ischemic time and. Uh, uh, also, I to clamp cross uh, and, you, and overall duration of surgery. So, what are the consequences of uh, both uh, operative fibrillation? It will increase your hospital stay and it will increase uh, uh, the cost. So, how are you going to prophylaxisly treat it uh, or uh, prophylaxically prevent atrial fibrillation from happening? So, uh, if he, uh, if the patient uh, uh, was it was on the beta blocker pre-op, you should start it as soon as possible, and this is a very strong recommendation. But if the patient was not uh, uh, in a pre-op, you initiate it just before or immediately after, after the surgery. If the patient has contraindication to beta blocker, according to the guideline, you could actually use an amyo to prevent atrial fibrillation. And if the patient cannot take beta blocker or amyo, you can still use uh, IV magnesium to prevent uh, atrial fibrillation, or you could, you could do by atrial pacing by putting it, uh, pacer wires in right and left, uh, left atria. So I'm not sure if all of you guys uh, familiar with sotolol, but sotolol, it's kind of beta blocker, but it lies into the uh, uh, class arrhythmia of three. Uh, uh, it's actually work, uh, it's uh, close to the uh, amidron. Uh, however, uh, sotolol uh, uh, was actually, uh, uh, most of the people in the worldwide, they didn't really like to use it because it associated with, uh, with the uh, increased risk of side effect from the sotolol. Uh, for high-risk patients, for post-operative atrial fibrillation, you can give Cetolol, or you can give a combination of two or more of beta blocker, magnesium, amidron, or by atrial basic. So when did we start uh, anticoagulation for uh, atrial, uh, atrial fibrillation? So according to the Canadian guidelines, you started into 72 hours post-op, and uh, you could do uh, uh, either or race uh, rate or rhythm control, but you have to reevaluate in, in six to 12 months. And I will show you uh, later why we do this. 
This is a, a, a paper uh, looking for grave control versus rhythm control in atrial fibrillation and cardiac surgery. This was published in 2016. So as you guys know, in an Ephraim trial, this is for non-surgical uh, atrial fibrillation. The people looking to uh, 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 rhythm control versus uh, 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 rate control. And uh, uh, the use of rhythm control show no offer of survival advantage and was associated with more frequent hospitalization advanced uh, uh, side effects. So in this study, they randomized 523 patients. It's multicentric. Uh, the rhythm control was by using amidron um, plus the rate control agent, and they use anticoagulation uh, comedin or warfarin. So their hypothesis, they want to convert rate versus rhythm control on post period. Their primary endpoint was the total days of, uh, of hospitalization in the first uh, uh, 60 days after randomization. They included any patient going for elective cabbage or uh, heart surgery or valve surgery. They, they, if they have uh, atrial fibrillation for more than 60 minutes, and less, less than seven days post-op. And the patient have no history of previous atrial fibrillation, so they want to make sure this patient is purely post-operative atrial fibrillation. So in this study, they found that the incidence of atrial fibrillation in cardiac surgery was 33% overall. The total number of hospitalized days in both group rate versus rhythm, there was no difference. The median was 5.1 in rate versus 5 in rhythm, with no difference was no significant death or serious advance. I want to look at this, guys, because this is very important, because sometimes we go crazy with rhythm control, but at the end, uh, uh, if you look at the rate control, they found that 93.8% uh, compared with 97.9% had a stable heart rhythm without atrial fibrillation in the, on the, in the first 30 days. And this was actually statistically significant. So in the first 30 days, the patient who is in rhythm control, who is in amidron, they will, they will have a better stable uh, rhythm. However, if you go beyond 30 days, you go for the 60 days, there will be uh, uh, no, no difference. So most of this atrial fibrillation, it's related to inflammation, and most of the people, they will go out of atrial fibrillation within uh, uh, two months after surgery. As you can see here, this is the, there was no uh, number of uh, days of indexed hospitalization and randomization, there was no difference. So they conclude there will be no difference between uh, neither treatment strategy should a net clinical advantage over each other. So you could use either or. Any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, kindly, thank you. Dr. A, I'm sorry, but there is a lot of information, but uh, I think at the end you will, you will see it's, uh, it's, it's very simple. Yeah, Dr. Mohammed, uh, uh, regarding the energy, energy source, what do you prefer, cryo or uh, RF, and which one is the best? Right. Uh, do you mind if I answer this question in the next talk? Because I'll talk in this in details. Is that yeah. okay? So, sure, thank you. Okay, sure. The question, just quickly, regarding rhythm versus rate control, especially in the post-operative period, we yes. usually, usually I, mean, I, I saw it in our hospital, different in other hospitals, we use a Mideron. What you prefer and what is better, especially because we will keep in our mind the side effect of the Mideron as well. If I answer you, I will be biased because I was trained in uh, two different institutions, okay? So when we, when we were in Canada, in Montreal, we used to use Sotolol all the time because Sotolol is very easy to use. You give it into 80 milligram POBID. It's like you're giving a beta blocker. It's oral medication, and it has very potent side, a very potent effect. So the patient will break atrial fibrillation very fast. However, you cannot use it in renal failure patients, and you cannot use it in low ejection fraction when the EF is less than 35%. Mm. However, when I trained into West Virginia, here is different because that's an arrhythmia excellent center. So we do a lot of ablation, like we do, uh, like we were doing uh, up to 10 ablation per week. Mm -hmm. So that's in that center, they prefer amidron. Nobody will use it at all, okay? Even the patient, when, when, when you do ablation surgery, practically you should start amidrip in the operating room and the patient should go to ICU and amidrip. Yeah. So I understand amidron. Look, amidron, people talk about amidron side effect. I think in my opinion, amidron side effect happens in long-term use. 
If you're going to use it for a year or two or three, then the patient will develop. But if you're going to use it for the first three months, the patient will not have, will not have a time to develop the thyrotoxicosis, the lung fibrosis. It can cause transient uh, liver injuries in the beginning, yes, but you have to be cautious. That's why I always, guys, ask you, you remember when you're around every day? Yeah. What is the QTC and what's the liver enzymes? This is what I ask about because amidron and sotolol will cause QT, uh, QT el uh, elongation. And what are the risks when the patient go into QT elongation? He can go into dorsat, right? Dorsat the point. So that's why when you start the patient amidron, you need to have you need to have a, a, a liver baseline that makes sure that his liver is fine, and you need to know what is a QTC uh, baseline so you know that you're not going to cause a harm for this patient. But uh, I am a, 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 a rhythm control maniac. That means I love when my patients walk into the hospital with normal sinus rhythm, I want a patient to be discharged in normal sinus rhythm. That's why I'm very advocate for, uh, as, you, as you know, by using amidron, using uh, even sometimes I do electrical cardioversion, even in stable patients. So let's say you have a stable patient with atrial fibrillation, post cabbage, let's say, okay? You give him amidron for the first uh, 24 to 48 hours, but he's still an AFib. So what are you going to do? So according to this study, as you know, you're going to discharge him. It's okay. You beat the blocker, but you have to anticoagulate him, right? Yes. But I prefer to give him amidron for 24 to 48 hours, electric cardiovertebral. If you can, if you be able to, to break this uh, AFib cycle, then I'll keep him for another 48 hours just to make sure he will be in sound system and will discharge him amidron with no, with no oral anticoagulation. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Very clear. Okay. So uh, I want go ahead. Yes. Definitely. Uh, my question, Dean King Faisal. Doctor, I don't know if you're going to talk about it in the next lecture, but uh, I see most of the surgeon use uh, like uh, a protocol for uh, post uh, ablation. Like they load the patient with amiodarone, then continue on uh, amiodarone oral for uh, next few uh, months, I would say, or weeks. So uh, how we can judge is this. Uh, I mean, uh, if the AFib disappears, is this a result of the surgery itself or uh, for maybe from the amiodarone we are giving? Yeah. This is a very important talk, okay? So in the first three months, there is always going to be uh, 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 what you call it a uh, blanking period. That means uh, even if the patient goes at atrial fibrillation, you don't call it a uh, uh, recurrence of atrial fibrillation because this patient will call atrial fibrillation. You treat post maze atrial fibrillation the first three months as a uh, uh, new or post-operative atrial fibrillation. You get my point? Yes, so we are waiting for the wound healing until the scar is formed and it will not be effective mm -hmm. on the person until the scar is formed. Is that right? Yes, but you should have transmurality right away when you do, uh, when you do, uh, when you do the maze. But uh, it's not only about, it's not uh, because practically, mm -hmm. When you do the when you do the cryo or you do the radio frequency, you should have the, the bike direction block right away. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The other thing is, uh, you will still have uh, uh, inflammation in the first three months because of the, what you do, right? And this okay. will be uh, 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 as we discussed before. This will be a substrate for the atrial fibrillation. So that's why we give amidron. And I will, uh, it's also uh, a surgeon preference and also depends on the patient. If you finish the case and the patient in severe bradycardia, you're not going to load him and you're not going to give amidron, right? Yes. As you guys, as you guys see with, when we do this ablation, we do, so far we did like six, seven cases. We don't do this. Like when, when I leave the OR, I know this patient's in severe junctional bradycardia and his heart rate in the 40s and I'm leaving the OR with, uh, with pacing. We will not give him too much amidron because we know that we're going to plant his, his AV nodal uh, more. So, yes, there is protocols. Uh, you should give him 150 of amidron in the OR. He should leave the OR with amidrep. And then he should be in amidron oral for three months. The first month, 400 milligram BOBID. Second month, 200 milligram BOBID. Third month, is 200 milligram BOD. This is the protocol. But it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a guidelines. It's put into... It's, not, it's a protocol, but you always can change it. It depends on, 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 uh, on the patient uh, situation. Okay? I see. Thank you, Doctor. So I want you guys to focus with me for the next talk because you will be surprised that nowadays we don't deal with pacemaker as much, but uh, you will be asked about it in the exams, you know, because you, you as, because pacemaker used to be put in by cardiac surgeon before. 
and you need to know uh, the basics of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the pacemaker and what are the indication to do a pacemaker, okay? So who's the patient at risk to develop a, a post-operative heart block? As you all know, when you operate in patients who have a valvular region that involving uh, uh, aortic valve or mitral valve or tricuspid valve, you're always at risk of uh, uh, injuring uh, uh, the conduction system. And you need to know the anatomical correlation. Like if you do a aortic valve, the area between uh, the right and the non at the commissure, it's the bundle of Hess, and here you can cause having a uh, heart block. When you do, uh, uh, when you do uh, uh, a mitral valve surgery at the area of the right trigone, where actually tricuspid, aortic, and mitral valve meet, this is uh, um, part of the AV node and bundle of Hess. And here you have also uh, um, uh, a risk of uh, injuring this. And also when you deal with uh, tricuspid valve, you know, the triangle of Koch, with tendon of tetero, uh, tricuspid annuli, and the coronary sinus, you know that there is the AV node and this, you can injure this. So this is very important when you do uh, either a valve replacement or repair, that you need to be uh, very careful uh, uh, about uh, the surrounding structure. Sometimes when you do a VSD repair, we know that from congenital rotation, when the patient have a VSD, they have abnormal conduction system. Sometimes the conduction system will go into the rim of the VSD, so you have to be careful. When you do myomectomy for HOCA, because these people sometimes they can end up with uh, uh, a bundle branch block. Uh, sometimes when you do surgery, you have a poor myocardial protection patient who will end up with, uh, with the uh, heart block. Or if you injure sometimes blood supply to the, to the conduction system, this is also can go. Or the patient come to you with infectious endocarditis. Uh, infection the cardiac that involving uh, 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 this area or victim cardiac that involving the aortomotor curtain with the AV node. All this is important to keep in mind about uh, uh, the conduction system. So what are the type of, of, of AV block? So AV block, as you all know from this, it's divided into first, second, and third degree AV block. So first degree AV block, it's basically the patient have prolonged PR interval, PR interval more than 200 milliseconds. Second uh, degree of A block, we have Mobit Stab 1, Mobit Stab 2. Mobit Stab 1, when you have a progressive, uh, 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 as you can see here, this is, if you look at the PR interval, it just, it's just more than 200 milliseconds. Mobit Stab 2, they see the PR interval, it goes uh, 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 gradually prolongation, and then you have the drop beat. This is what we call Mobit Stab 1, or Wilkie Bach. And then we have the second degree of A block when we have uh, uh, a fixed PR interval, but all of a sudden you have a drop beat. Or you can have a, a, a second uh, degree AV block, but, but two, two to one block. Or you can have the third degree AV block with the junction escape. That means that there will be no uh, association between uh, the QRS and the P waves. So what are the causes of AV block? This is very important to know. It could be ischemia, as we said. It could be iatrogenic uh, post ablation. It could be infective endocarditis, Lyme disease. It could be degenerative, post-surgical. And you need to know. The, the most common valve associated with, uh, with uh, conduction problems is AVR followed by mitral valve followed by TV repair. Because you know the, now the TV repair, the new techniques of TV repair by using the C-clamped or the C-shaped um, uh, ring that prevent you going into the conduction area. It could be congenital, it could be systemic lupus and cardiomyopathy. This is a very important question. So why the patient will have sinus node dysfunction? Again, it could be ischemia, ischemic heart disease, Sometimes patients have a cardiomyopathy or the patient have a, a, a reflex disease, such as a patient, uh, like especially young females, they have a vasovagal or hypertensive carotid artery disease. So this is a, 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 a you can go through this. This is from also Cohen, uh, but I want you, uh, we will discuss uh, the AHA guidelines for pacemaker in details. So pacemaker for sinus node dysfunction, what are the class one indication? Class one indication, sorry. Class one indication, if the patient have symptomatic bradycardia, this means the patient presents you with frequent poses, or the patient have symptomatic chronotropic incompetency. What does mean chronotropic incompetency? We all know that when, when anybody try to make any uh, physical activity, the heart by itself, I mean, the, 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 the sympathetic system will increase our heart, our, uh, our uh, heart rate to maintain the cardiac output. But sometimes the patient will have this, except in athletes, athletes will all have uh, low heart rate, but in, in normal people, some, when they have chronic incompetency, this is one of the indications that you need to put a pacemaker. Or if the patient have symptomatic bradycardia with medication, that means 
patient uh, presented with tachycardia, you start on medication, and he goes from tachy to bradyh, you know? Class 2A, if the patient heart rate is than 40, or if there is a syncope that will uh, uh, unexplained with the uh, uh, unexplained, or if the patient have a sinus node dysfunction that discovered in an EB study. So pacemaker for AV block. So if the patient presented with third degree AV block at any atom anatomical level, then uh, what are the class one indication? If it's associated with the symptomatic uh, uh, with symptoms like CHF or ventricular arrhythmias, uh, or any medical therapy cause uh, third degree AV block or if there is a systole for more than three seconds, or the escape rhythm of the patient less than 40, or AFib with one or more pauses of more than five seconds, and after catheter ablation with third degree AV block, after surgery with third degree AV block, or if the patient have neuromuscular disorders. If the patient have a second degree AV block, it has to be symptomatic for him to go for uh, a pacemaker, or a symptomatic persistence AV block of ventricular heart rate 40, or higher with LV dysfunction. So if the patient have a chronic biphysical block, what are the one class one indication? If the patient goes in intermittent, that means he's, he's in biphysical block, but sometimes he go into third degree block, or uh, uh, type two second degree, that means he goes to a uh, uh, mobile type two, or alternating bundle branch, uh, he goes into uh, uh, right or left. In acute MI, if the patient have a persistent second degree AV block in his or Purkinje system with STEMI, if he will have alternating bundle branch or he goes into third degree block, transient advanced second degree or third degree inf uh, uh, infranodal with associated with bundle branch block. Infranodal, that means below the AV node. And persistent symptoms second or third degree. This is all class one indication. Uh, a base maker for carotid syndrome, if the patient have recurrent syncope due to carotid stimulation result in ventricular uh, uh, syncope for more than uh, 33 seconds. So also on Hocum, there is an indication to, to, to use a pacemaker. So if the patient have the same uh, uh, indication, if the patient have sinus node dysfunction or AV block, however, uh, if the patient symptomatic LV, LV obstruction at rest, some people do use uh, uh, a pacemaker. Uh, just to, to cause a delay into the RV, uh, uh, L, RV, L, RV to LV uh, uh, stimulation. And this indeed will decrease your LVOT uh, obstruction. However, if the patient is have a risk, a risk factor for sudden heart, uh, cardiac death, he should go for the next degree, not only base maker, but miss maker with ICD, DDD. Uh, you might be asked, who is the patient uh, for risk factor for sudden cardiac death in Hocum? And we've been asked this question multiple times. So if the patient have uh, a family history of sudden cardiac death, if the patient presents with a syncope, if you look at the echo and the patient have a massive wall thickness more than 30 millimeter, or if the patient have non-sustained VT, or if the patient have abnormal blood pressure response to exercise, we know that when we exercise, our blood pressure increase. But when this patient exercise, they will have a hyperdynamic heart, and then LVO tube struct, and then their blood pressure actually drop. And this is the patient at risk of going with sudden, sudden cardiac death. So uh, we all know CRT. CRT means you actually uh, chronic uh, resynchronization therapy. Instead of basing one ventricle, you need to base both ventricle. This is the Canadian guidelines from 2013. So what are the recommendations for? What are the recommended when we use a CRT? So if the patient presented with a New York heart failure in class uh, two or three, or ambulatory class four heart failure, you have to have an injection fraction this than 35%. You have to focus on this because this is very important. And in QRS, more than 130 milliseconds. If the patient have a left bundle branch block and he's in sinus rhythm, an absence of the severe coronary kidney disease, this means his creatinine is than 200 and his GFR is more than 30. How we evaluate his additional fraction, either you use uh, uh, echocardiogram or cardiac uh, imaging or any nuclear imaging. And you continue warfarin for high risk if the patient have high risk of uh, thromboembolism. This means if the patient have his ejection fraction is very low and he, he, he is at risk of developing LV thrombs. Uh, if the patient have a QRS, uh, uh, this is we can consider it. If, if he's non left bundle branch block, if the QRS more than 150. If the patient have a uh, 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 presence of atrial fibrillation, also the chronic resynchronization therapy effect will be less. If the patient's elderly and if the patient uh, is frail and if they have uh, um, chronic, it can be considered a chronic RV basing with ejection fraction less than 45%. Uh, imaging uh, for assistant LV lead uh, placements, 
This means you have to, uh, after you do your LV, you have to assess that the LV is in a good position. Uh, and you can use an oval uh, anticoagulation, uh, uh, can be uh, considered on an individual basis. However, if you look at the American guidelines, American guidelines is very important. They don't look into, they don't say 130, 150 QRS. Their QRS, it's actually 150. However, their, their class of recommendation is different. So if the patient is less than, uh, ejection fraction less than 35, sorry, and he's a normal sinus rhythm on maximum medical therapy, if he's, if he's coming with left bundle branch block and QRS more than 150, then he's class one indication. And the patient have a New York Association class two or more. However, if the patient have less than 35%, he's a normal sinus rhythm and maximum medical therapy. However, he's non left bundle branch block, but his QRS is more than 150, this is class 2A. Or if he's left bundle branch block, but QRS is less than 150, it's between 120 to 149. If the patient goes in from normal sinus rhythm to atrial fibrillation, this is goes from class 1 to class 2A. And if the patient's going for any, for, for any device, like let's say a patient have a heart block and he needs to go for a device, if his ejection fraction is 40%, and you, in future, you anticipate he will need a device, then you consider him for a CRT. So when we say a pacemaker, we see like DDD, DDO, C, uh, a, 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 uh, AAI, VVI. What do we mean by this? So this is a very important when you, when you, when you deal uh, with, with pacemaker. So the first letter, that means which chamber you're, you're uh, your basing. The second letter, it's which chamber you're sensing. And the third letter, what are the algorithms? Are you gonna trigger? That means you're gonna pace. Or are you gonna are you gonna inhibit? That means you're gonna inhibit the pacemaker. DDD means you're gonna trigger and inhibit. OO, that means there will be no function. Okay. You get my uh, so when we when we when we do when we do uh, D, v, uh, v O O. V O O means you're just pacing the ventricle, you're, regardless. This is like an emergency mode. I don't care about what I'm sensing. I don't care about the algorithm. I'm just gonna pace the ventricle. AAO, this is only in heart transplant because you just want to pace the atrium. Now, we, we call it demanding pacing. Demanding pacing, that means VVI and AAI. VVI, you're pacing the, ventri the ventricle, you're sensing the ventricle and you're inhibiting. Inhibiting mean when the, when the ventricle beat above your, uh, your set rate, then the, the base maker will, will inhibit. When we see a VDD, VDD means I'm basing the ventricle, I'm sensing the both ventricle, uh, both uh, 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 chambers, and I'm inhibiting and triggering uh, uh, both. Uh, that's this basing ventricle, but sensing both. And when you say DDD, so I'm, 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 I'm basing both, sensing both, and doing both function. I'm triggering, that means I'm basing, or I'm inhibiting. So when you do a pacemaker, especially temporary pacemaker, when you put a pacemaker wires in the heart, you need to know the, the, the physiology, the cellular physiology. We all know the resting potential of the, of the cell is negative from, uh, uh, from inside and positive from outside. So you activate the cells, you have to apply a negative charge on outside and this produces a gradual potential difference. So that's why when we, uh, when we placed, uh, uh, if you use a, a, a unipolar, this means you put only single lead in the heart and one lead in the skin, you have to make sure the negative lead goes into the heart because the heart is positive, your lead is negative, this should decrease your threshold and this will make your, 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 uh, your pacemaker more effective. That's why sometimes if you do a unipolar pacemaker, you have to change the polarity to get a better potential. Dual chamber pacing, uh, that means you do, you pace atria and ventricle. And this by indeed should increase your stroke volume by 5 to 15% because you will have the atrial kick. Sometimes RV basing can cause a disturbed conduction, uh, like it can cause a, a wide QRS, and sometimes you need to paste the, 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 the ROT, uh, RVOT uh, uh, basing leads this to just to improve the conduction system. In cardiomyopathy, you do the, the CRT, uh, which we could talk before. And this is to improve the, the, the septum and free wall uh, contraction. No, if you, something called upper and lower rate, this is very important and dual basic. This is a, uh, you always hear electrophysiologists talk uh, about this. So what do we mean by upper and lower? So if the atrial heart rate between upper and lower, you keep basing AV one to one. Let's say I, I set the pacemaker from 60 
200, okay? And your atria rate is between 60 to 100. That means you're gonna sense the atria and you're gonna pace the ventricle at the same rate. So, um, okay, I'm sensing atria at 60, I'm pacing ventricle at 60, okay? So what happens if the atria rate goes below what you set? You set the pacemaker at 60 and atria now at 55. Then you're gonna both pace both. I'm gonna pace the atria at 60 and ventricle at 60. So what happened if the, if, the, if the atria rate goes above your set? So the atria rate now is 110. So what's gonna happen? Then you're gonna lose, you're not gonna pace the ventricle above 100, and then you're gonna lose your AV uh, resynchrony. So did you guys hear about DDDR, which is dual chamber pacemaker uh, responsive, which is a rate responsive pacemaker? This is very important, especially in athletes and young people, because when you do, when you increase your activity, you need to increase your heart rate. So this pacemaker will actually uh, sense this, and it might actually increase your uh, your uh, your pacing. And the, the, the most important thing, how you're gonna sense uh, the response. So the companies make a, a, a different uh, uh, algorithms. Some pacemaker will sense your respiratory rate because when you exercise, you increase your respiratory rate. Some pacemaker, the movement, like when you move your arm, it will move the pectoral muscle and then the pacemaker will sense and it will increase your heart rate. Some people look at the QT interval what, uh, because when you try to uh, exercise, uh, you try to uh, um, uh, increase your heart rate and then uh, this could affect the QT and then uh, uh, increase your response. Uh, some venous sat because when you exercise, uh, you will increase oxygen extraction, and then the venous sat will uh, will go down. So, and uh, some uh, look into RV systolic volume or RV systolic pressure. This is different, but you might be asked about what are the response that you could use. Uh, this is, could be a very uh, good uh, written questions in the exam. So, how do you choose a pacemaker? Uh, when I'm going to give the patient DDD, when I'm with the patient VBI, when I'm giving the patient AI when I'm gonna do the biometrical basic. So in, practically, any patient walks to the hospital, you should go with, with a dual chamber. Unless if the patient atrial fibrillation, even if the patient atrial fibrillation have a paroxysmal AFib, he might be still benefit from having uh, a dual chamber pacemaker. If the patient presented with the bradycardia and atrial fibrillation already like long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, and, there is, and you know that you're not gonna treat his atrial fibrillation, then you do need to do a dual, base, a dual uh, chamber pacemaker. You just could give him a VVI. AAI, it's very rarely used, but we use it in, in heart transplant patient. When the patient have a normal conduction system, but they have is you know, dysfunction. You, you guys know from the transplant literature, because when we transplant the heart, we totally d d do this disconnection between the, the sympathetic tone and the heart. And these people, they might end up with chronic uh, incompetency and then they, they required uh, AI pacemaker. All you do by ventricular, which you call practically the CRT. And as you guys know from uh, the guidelines, they should have ejection fraction less than 35%. QRS, according to Canadian guidelines, uh, 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 more than uh, 130 with a symptomatic heart failure, or you can uh, f uh, follow American guidelines. So when you talk about pacemaker technology, what's the better? So do we do a bicardial or endocardial basic? So practically, endocardial basic, it, it's better than uh, 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 pericardial because of electrical characteristics of, of, the, of the lead and because of the stress-related fracture of this. However, sometimes we faced to do a uh, uh, bicardial lead. As if you guys know, I operated in a patient like months ago. He came with infected pacemaker uh, and sepsis, so we have to take out his pacemaker. We have to, and they have to replace his tricuspid valve. And then we, we did for him a bicardial, uh, which is uh, infected pacemaker, obstructed uh, uh, obstruction, the tricuspid valve, or if the patient have symptomatic tricuspid uh, regurgitation. That means they put a pacemaker, the patient ended up with moderate to severe TR and he has uh, RV failure. Then you have no choice just to take the pacemaker out and then you do for him any bicardial pacemakers or if the patient have no access to the pacemaker, like if the patient have from both vascular access, or sometimes in congenital cases. You still can use, some people take the epicardial leads, the endocardial, and just put them into the surface of the heart. Some people do this, but we have uh, a specific uh, pacemaker uh, leads for uh, endocardial, uh, for the epicardial. And you can actually, uh, uh, if you anticipate that you still need to put endocardial pacemaker when you do a tricuspid valve repair, you could actually pass 
the epicardial uh, stitch to the RV from the atrium. You ask with the help of your EB colleagues, they put it for you in the position and then you put it across the annulus before you do your tricuspid valve and then you fix it at the tricuspid valve. Pacemaker technology, you can use unipolar versus bipolar. Unipolar, that means there is a single lead in the heart and there is a ground lead which is into, into, the, into, the, uh, into the patient, into the patient's service. Um, uh, and as we discussed before, the, the, the lead in the heart is a negative one and the ground which is the patient's skin or the patient's service is positive and we understand why. Or bipolar when the both lead actually in the patient's heart. This is very important. Uh, uh, most of the people now use only bipolar because this is decreased uh, pacing of the diaphragm and chest wall and will also improve the threshold for pacing. Usually patients put this from the left subclavian or axillary artery. People sometimes can use cephalic vein. The most important thing when you do a pacemaker, even in the operating room with the cartel, you have to check what are the uh, right ventricular uh, lead um, uh, parameters. So your threshold should be less than 0.7 that you can you can still base the ventricle less than 0 uh, 0.7 voltage. Your RV, your RV amplitude, that means you take the RV wave at five millivolt and your impedance is uh, 4,000 to 100 and you can increase it out for the pacemaker up to 10 and you're still not pacing the, 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 the diaphragm. That's a very important when you do uh, an RV uh, pacemaker lead. A miracle study for uh, bivendricular pacing, it's improved the symptoms, decreased the mortality. And, but you have to keep in mind, if the patient have a cardiomyopathy with very dilated RV and uh, uh, RA, sometimes it's very difficult to do uh, um, uh, an uh, LV lead uh, because the, the lead will not stuck in the coronary sinus. And the, sometimes these patients ended up going for minimally invasive surgical LV lead. What are the pacemaker complications? Mortality is very rare. But what, sometimes you will be asked, what are the mortality causes of the pacemaker? It could be VT, VF, uh, or the patient dependent and there will be displacement and the patient will die from uh, or the patient will have uh, uh, a cardiac perforation uh, uh, or uh, an air impulse. Uh, early complication in the pacemaker can happen in 6.4%. Uh, uh, anything can happen like lead displacement, lead fracture, uh, crush syndrome, if you put the lead and the, between the clavicle and the, the first trip. Uh, sometimes lead dysfunction, just a manufacturing problem. Sometimes the lead will perforate. Pacemaker infection, you can cause a pneumothorax or hemothorax if you perforate one of the, 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 the uh, vein, the subclavian vein. If you uh, uh, increase the patient, uh, 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 increase the heart rate and the patient have a demand ischemia, this can cause an MI. Or you could have uh, a pacemaker syndrome. Pacemaker syndrome means sometimes you do only VVI, you will lose the AV synchrony and then you will have a contraction of vitreous against close uh, tricuspid valve. And you have, this is a very important thing, which is undersensitivity or oversensitivity. Undersensitivity, that means uh, 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 you can base on a T wave. That means you're not uh, 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 detecting the proper electrical conduction, and then you can base while the patient is conducting. And this is very, this is very dangerous. You could base on the T wave, and the patient can go into VTAC. Oversensitivity, that means you can sense anything as, as, a, as a heartbeat, and then you will not base the patient. And this is uh, like detecting artifact as an electrical. And then we're going to talk, uh, the next two phenomena is very important. You're not going to see it nowadays, but you might be asked about it, which is crosstalk and pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So what is crosstalk? Crosstalk, it's when you have a, a, a dual chamber, and then the atrial spikes is very high. And then the ventricular lead will, will, will read this atrial spikes as a ventricular contraction, and then the pacemaker will not pace. So what are some of the causes of uh, crosstalk? Either the atrial lead displaced into the ventricle, this is one thing, or uh, uh, the ventricle lead goes into the atrium, or the output from the A lead is very high, or the sensitivity in the V lead is very high, or there will be short planking V lead because in the new pacemakers, the new technology of pacemakers, uh, they, they make planking V lead. It means when you base the atria, there will be a short time of no pacing in the AV lead unless to see if the, if the AV node will conduct. If the AV node will not conduct, then the AV lead will take, will take place. So how you treat uh, 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 crosstalk? So you have to make sure that, uh, first of all, the lead's in the good position. Then if the output in the A lead is very high, you have to decrease the output. 
uh, if the if the sensitivity in the V lead is high, you have to decrease the, the sensitivity. You have, if the blanking period of the V lead is not good, you have to increase the blanking period. And if you have this phenomena, you just put the vase maker in VVI and VOO, just emergency. Like if you're in the middle of a night and you have crosstalk, then uh, uh, and uh, to, to, you cannot get to, to program the base maker, just put a magnet or put it in emergency and uh, keep it uh, uh, keep it uh, basic. So what is the base maker mediated tachycardia? The base maker mediated tachycardia, this is happens in the DDDD base maker. And this, when, when the AV node, uh, which uh, uh, were, were, uh, there will be a retrograde uh, impulse going from the AV node, uh, which lead that the pacemaker sends the atrial depolarization and pacing the ventricle to the upper rate. This is a very important because sometimes you put a pacemaker and then you see the patient is, is going into tachycardia because the AV node here is still conducting, but not conducting in a good way and conducting actually uh, retro, uh, retrograde. And then the patient feel this retrograde uh, as 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 uh, as depolarization and will pace in a higher rate. So you have to decrease uh, your upper limit. You have to increase your uh, atrial refractory period into uh, uh, to th 300 to 300 milliseconds. Sometimes if the patient goes in SVT, you have to give him adenosine just to break and see what's going on. And if you're stuck, you just put the magnet and put it in VVI pacemaker. Also, you have to be aware of electrocutary and pacemaker. Like sometimes you get into the operating room, patient has a pacemaker. So when you use electrocutary, if the patient has a unipolar pacemaker, the risk of damage is more than the bipolar. What is the possible effect of electrocutary? Sometimes you see in the operating room, you use electrocutary, the patient will not pace. So sensing the electromagnetic interference with increased heart rate and inhibit the pacemaker. Sometimes post op you have to reprogram the pacemaker because electrocutary could affect the pacemaker, and uh, revision pacemaker to backup mode after using the magnet mode because now, when you if you put a magnet in the pacemaker just to make the pacemaker pace all the time, instead of going DDD you put it uh, VOO, then you have to ask the, your EP guys to reprogram your pacemaker after you finish your surgery. So you you might be asked what is the magnet mode? Magnet mode it's mean you put the pacemaker into VOO that means a sink. That does not matter what's the atrial rate. Just pace the ventricle because you don't want the electrocutary to interfere with the pacemaker. So there is some. Uh, uh, we're not going to go in details with uh, uh, with adult congenital and pediatrics, but there is some consideration with pacemaker when we talk about adult congenital and pediatrics. If the patient had the resistance left subclavian, you know that you're not going to be able to go to to the uh, to the right atrium uh, in in a good way from the left side, because sometimes the most commonly this vein will end up in coronary sinus. Then you should not go to the left side. You go to the right side. If the patient have a mustard uh, or, or, uh, or Glenn operation, mustard is atrial switch surgery. And Glenn, that means when you switch is the SVC for the patient to go to the pulmonary vein. This, you have to use a fixation lead, okay? If the patient have a corrected transposition, corrected transposition, that means uh, uh, um, uh, the RV still, uh, 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 that means the, the RV is a systematic, uh, 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 ventricle, you have to be careful that you not, but you have to put the lead in the smooth right ventricular surface. If the patient have Fontan, Fontan, when you do Fontan, as you know, Fontan, you totally separate the atria from the heart, from the heart to, uh, 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 sorry, you separate, uh, uh, you, you make all the venous return uh, going into, into, the, into the pulmonary artery. So uh, you have to be careful with this patient. And you, if you want to base your ventricle, the only access to you to base the ventricle is the coronary sinus. Uh, 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 and the children, better to use the fixation leads. And even when you deal with kids, you have to keep the, the loop inside because this heart will grow. And then sometimes there will be stretch in the leads. Option of access is the same. It could be axillary cephalic subclavian, or you could do thoracotomy. If the patient less than six months, uh, the transvenous approach is, is limited. So um, uh, it's better to go for surgical pacemaker. If the patient less than six years old, you put the pacemaker into the Subpictural, not you don't between the pictorial and the skin because to prevent risk of infection. Transplant, as we said, if the patient has sinus arrest or tachycardia. So how you how you test if the patient need a pacemaker? So what you do, you need uh, 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 to place uh, uh, an atrial lead and you base the atria at, at at 150. And you see if there is a conduction one to one, 
there will be no need for for ventricular pacing you just put the atrial wire in the hokan patients as we this as we said before uh, 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 rv pacing will prolong the ev interval which lead to decrease uh, the, the the change in excitement of the rv to the lv and this indeed should decrease your uh, outflow obstruction but if the patient at, at high risk of sudden cardiac death the patient will go from uh, need of pacemaker to the icd so what is the indication for uh, uh, the, the indication for the icd we're going to go this in details more if the patient have a, a, a vt with without an mi and is not suitable for medical or, or, or surgical therapy or eb study demonstrated that the patient with a, a have a vt with a history of uh, non sustained vt or mi or MI with ejection fraction less than 30%. Most of the devices inserted uh, subpectoral. Uh, most common devices we use a bipolar. You have to understand that uh, one third of the shock is actually an appropriate shock. This is due to SVT or atrial arrhythmias. And you can use uh, 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 an ICD, use also dual chamber like atrial ventricular, just to make sure that to prevent shock and inappropriately during SVT. And usually the output of the, of the ICD is from 600 to 800 voltage, 30 to 40 joule. So according to 2016 Canadian guideline for the ICD, ICD consider uh, in a primary prevention in, in, in terms of uh, ischemic and non-ischemic population. If the patient in three months in, uh, on, uh, uh, on optimum medical therapy, if he's a three months after revascularization and 40 days after MI, if, if no, you have to go back. You do not consider ICD, you have to wait. If yes, then you look at the ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction of the patient is not 30%, this is a strong recommend that you put for him ICD. If the ejection fraction between 31 to 35%, then ICD might be indicated with weak recommendation. You have to make sure that you assess the comorbidities and frailty, assess the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction uh, with recovery or deterioration suspected, and you have to make sure that the patient have a complete revascularization. Now, ICD consideration for secondary prevention an ischemic and non-ischemic, if the patient have a cardiac arrest due to VT, VFEP, or sustained VT in the presence of significant structural heart disease, or sustained VT more than 40 hours post MI revascularization. If it's reversible, try to treat the cause. If not reversible, in the first two, it's a strong recommendation. In the third one, which is uh, post MI, it's weak recommendation. So AHA guidelines, it's actually more detailed. So if the patient survive a cardiac arrest due to VFEP, or hemodynamic unstable VTAC with irreversible cause. Structural heart disease with sustained VT regardless of the hemodynamics. Syncope or induced VT VFEP by EV study. Or if the ejection fraction less than 35% uh, 40 days post MI in a class two or class three. If the patient is uh, uh, in, in New York patient class one, his ejection fraction should be less than 30%. If the patient have a dilated cardiomyopathy with ejection fraction 35% with the New York patient class two to three, or if there is inducible VT, VFIP, post MI with an ejection fraction is down 40%. This is class one indication. The most important thing you need to know about, about uh, uh, ICD is the, uh, is the defibrillation uh, threshold. That means what are the minimum areas you need to break on the VT, VT, VT VFIP to put the patient go to back to Samstrad. So how we test this? So we take the patient to the AB lab and then we induce the VT. And then we, we ask the, 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 the ICD to terminate this VTEC, uh, VTEC, uh, v, v, VFEP VTAC. And then you set the, the DFIP threshold according to the ICD output. And should be at least uh, a 10 joule less than what are the ICD give. Sometimes you find the output is very high. Like we said, the recommended is 30 to 40. You find it sometimes it goes high, like 70, 80. Then you can use what you call it a subcutaneous patches, which would put uh, around the heart to distribute the shock into the LV. And you need to know that when the patient goes into, the, uh, into, uh, uh, into shock, sometimes they can have uh, depressed myocardium and decreased uh, cardiac output. So again, if the patient have an ICD and you take him for surgery, you have to put a magnet because you want to prevent the patient to go into shock. Um, uh, even if you put the patient into magnet, but sometimes the pacemaker still can function as VVI. And you need to reprogram the ICD after you finish. But sometimes you need to know what are the indications to do a magnet into the ICD. I know in surgery, but let's say uh, the patient is having an ICD, but now he's a DNR, and he go in VTEC and VFA, and, and the ICD keep shocking him. This is one of the indications that you put a magnet to prevent the ICD because you want end-of-life event. 
or uh, the patient presented to you with frequent shock, but when you test the ICD, most of the shocks due to SVT, then you have inhibited just to treat the primary cause. Or when you do surgery, or sometimes when you do resuscitation, because when you do resuscitation, you don't want the ICD to keep interfering with you because you want to do uh, uh, chest compression, then uh, you inhibit the ICD by using the magnet. Uh, if you have uh, a refractory VFIP with ICD, after you insert the ICD, you have to make sure that uh, you don't have a lift pneumothorax that uh, can cause uh, uh, an appropriate shock, or uh, your ICD uh, is, uh, lead is not good, or the patient going into MI. That's the most important thing that you need to rule out. What is the ICD complication? Most of the ICDs have a battery lifetime, 60 months, so you need to have a battery change. Uh, lead dysfunction, this happens into 50% after 10 years. Again, the same thing, over-sensing, under-sensing. So it, it might sense anything and then give shock for inappropriately or under-sensing. That means it will not sense anything and will not shock in proper time. Or if the patient have a high defibrillation threshold and this you need to do the subcutaneous uh, uh, leads to, to help LV shocking. Or sometimes when you have exit block, when you have uh, uh, a scar or uh, uh, around the, and when, even when you give a shock, it will not go out, or if you have a lead fracture. The last thing we talk about in this uh, is device infection, so this should take five minutes. Any questions in the previous section before we go to the device infection? No question? Uh, Dr. Dr. Hamad. Uh, yes, uh, some surgeons, they don't uh, put uh, prophylactic uh, epicardial leads in low-risk uh, patients like cabbage patients. Uh, what do you think of this practice? Uh, all my patients end up with the, with the base maker wires. Because Is sometimes, any, yeah. I know some oh. surgeons, some surgeons the, in the cabbage patient, they don't do uh, base maker uh, wires. But I, I recommend you, especially when you start your practice, just leave the wire on because sometimes there is things happen unexplained. You know, patient go, patient, patient, patient and and fast AFib. You try to correct the AFib, and then all of a sudden the patient go into bradycardia, and then you ended up with uh, a tragic uh, scene. So no, I think any patient you have the his chest is open in front of you. You have the luxury to put uh, at least uh, V wires, and if uh, and I think all the people who works with me know that. Most of my patients leave the OR with AV wire. I'm very big fan of uh, AV basic or AV uh, synchrony basic. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, last question. Um, last year we had uh, this question. Uh, it said, um, what is the most physiological mode in, uh, in basing? Is it uh, VVI, DDD? And there was a lot of discussion about it. What do you think? I, the safe answer is uh, DDD. This is the most physiological. Why? Because now if your atria is functioning normal, that you have an, an, an AV block, you don't need to, you, you, you just need to, uh, to sense your atria, right? Yes. And base, and base the ventricle. However, if your atria goes very low, like sometimes you're going to have an, a, an uh, SA, SA node uh, 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 dysfunction. So you still need to base the atria and ventricle at the same time. So you really need to sense, trigger, and inhibit in both chambers to get the most physiological uh, uh, basic. Thank you, sir. And even in your practice, if you're going to put a pacemaker for any people, always call your AV colleague, convince him, please put me a DDD pacemaker because they have the luxury to do it, you know? I think okay. in this era now, Yes. Nobody should end up with VVI unless if the patient is an AFib and he is, this is, uh, and you know that you're not going to treat this AFib whatsoever. Otherwise, everybody should have put, ended up with uh, DDDD best maker. That's great, sir. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to uh, do this and quickly, and then we'll give you a break, and then we'll come back to the next talk, okay? So uh, device infection, this is very important because uh, you're going to deal with this. I, I dealt with it here. Uh, in, uh, in this institution since I joined here twice. In Canada, it was very common to deal with this problem. So you need to know that the incidence of uh, device infection, if it's in the pectoral area, is very low, 
sometimes in, the, in pediatric cases or in certain cases when you have a problem with uh, with uh, uh, pectoral areas, you can put it in abdomen, and this is actually carries a, a little bit higher risk with 3.2 percent. What is the risk factor for device infection, uh, uh, including uh, diabetes mellitus, heart failure, renal failure, immunosuppressed patient? Redo cases sometimes patients come with the pacemaker problems. You do redo. This is at higher risk. Or, or if you use a, 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 a three uh, like a CRT, this is also another because there is a lot of hardware. If the patient needs anticoagulation post-op because he could develop hematoma at the site and it can develop a increased risk infection. And also operator and very procedural dependent. This means a break and sterility technique in the cath lab or in the OR, or if there is an appropriate administration of antibiotics. So what are the most common cause of this? It is coagulase negative uh, stabilococcus. This is, uh, according to the AHA guidelines, this is responsible for 42%, followed by staph aureus, which is oxycillin uh, sensitive, uh, and then uh, uh, followed by uh, 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 gram-negative bacilli, then polymicrobial, gram-negative, then you have uh, other gram-positive cocci, uh, then you have um, MRSA, and fi finally fungal is very less, less than 2%. So how we diagnose them? You need to have at least two sets of blood culture to diagnose that this is device is infected. You need to get a gram stain from the bucket. And if you suspect that the infection is, is, uh, is involving the lead and tricuspid valve, this patient should go for TE. So this is the diagram. This is very important, guys, to if you suspect uh, an, an, an device infection. So first of all, you do blood culture. What happens if the blood culture is negative and what happens if the blood culture is positive? If the blood culture is positive or if the patient receive antibiotics before we do the blood culture, you send them for a TEE. Then you see, if the TEE is negative, is it lead or it's also involving the valve? If it's involving the valve, this is very simple. It goes to the valve infected endocarditis. You should treat this patient as you treat any valve infected endocarditis. So you follow AHA guidelines for treatment of valve infected endocarditis. If the lead is infected, then you see, is the lead, is this infection, is complicated or uncomplicated? Complicated means it causes venous thrombosis, uh, this uh, it causes osteomyelitis. Then you have to treat him for four to six weeks of IV antibiotics. If this is not complicated, then you treat him as you treat a negative TEA. So what's negative TEA said? Is it staph or non-staph? If it's non-staph, you just treat it for two weeks of IV antibiotics and you don't need to repeat the TEA. But if it's staph aureus, you have to treat him to two to four weeks, you extend the period, and you have to get a repeated TEA in two weeks. So what happens if the blood culture is negative? If the blood culture is negative, then you go. Is the bucket is infected? If the bucket is infected, you treat them with 10 to 14 days of antibiotics. If, if, the, if there is lead erosion, you treat them with seven to 10 days of antibiotics. And now, when I need to remove the infected base maker or infected device, if there is a valve or lead infected endocarditis, like there is a clearly complicated lead or valve infected endocarditis, or if there is bucket infection, here, here we're talking about, sorry, here we're talking about how you're gonna uh, uh, treat them with antibiotics and what are the antibiotic duration. And here we talk about when you're gonna take them out. So if you have valve or, uh, or lead infected with endocarditis, this should come out. Uh, if you have a booked infection, means there is uh, abscess or there is device erosion or there is the skin dehiscence or there is chronic sinus, this should come out. Or there is valve infected with endocarditis, you, like you see, the lead is clean, but the valve is infected. By definition, this lead should come out. Like let's say this patient comes with valve victim endocarditis. He's IV drug abused. He has a device and he has tricuspid valve victim endocarditis. Or the patient have a, a pacemaker and he had aortic valve victim endocarditis. By definition, this uh, uh, there is bacteremia. This pacemaker should come out, and we'll talk about when we need to insert another one. Or you don't have no infected endocarditis, but you have Staph bacteremia, then this is another indication to remove the base maker. What is the anti microbial prophylaxis? You give the patient ANSIF or uh, vancomycin. The ANSIF should be given one hour, or what you call cefazolin here, and vancomycin should be given two hours prior to incision. So, when do we implant a new device? This is depends. If it's blood culture positive, the uh, positive, then you have to repeat the blood culture after removal. If it's only lead, that means the valve is not involved, then you implant the ICD within 72 hours from the lead negative. But if the valve is involved, you have to implant after 14 days. If the blood culture is positive, but T is negative, 
you remove you repeat blood culture repeat blood culture negative in 72 hours then you, you you implant another one if it's not if the if the lead and the valve is not involved it's just the the, the generators then you, you wait for negative uh, blood culture for 72 hours and then you implant your new ICT. Okay, it's a clear. Hello. Yes, yes, clear. clear. This is very this is very important, guys, because you you're gonna get a call from one of your EBs one day. You know, I have this problem, so you need to know. You need to be aware of uh, what is the indication. Uh, when to take it out and what when to reimplant it. Okay. So I have a, a quick quiz for you guys. Can anybody tell me what what EKG is this? Looks like a, a white complexus VT. This is VT. Yes. Okay. But what, what do you see in this SVT? There's something very, uh, very uh, obvious about it. Delta wave. There is delta waves. So what's this? Yes. This is uh, WBW. This is WBW. Excellent. So what about this EKG? The voltage is uh, alternate. What do you call this? Uh, I forgot. I have something alternate. <laughs> I don't know. You're very close. Anybody knows? Uh, oh, I forget the name. It's called pulses alternus. Pulses alternus. Yeah. And when do you see this phenomenon? Uh, Tamponading or pericard huge pericardial effect. Excellent, guys. Perfect. Any questions? You covered almost everything. <laughs> so, All the questions that I had. Uh, yeah. Perfect. So take a take a ten minutes break, and we'll be back at three o'clock. Okay. Okay. Uh, Haytham, Haytham, uh, uh, make sure uh, 